may feel like they maybe outgrew the relationship that you guys are in. You know what? That's okay. That's 100% okay. Because everyone's gonna grow through high school. You guys are gonna meet new people, you know, not talk to the same people you've been talking to in grade school or, or freshman year to, you know, sophomore, junior, senior year. You guys, your friends are gonna change. Your groups are gonna change. And that's totally okay. But you gotta keep doing you, okay? You gotta keep doing you. Whatever kind of emotion you have about your friend walking away or um, a relationship kind of fizzling out, take it in, understand what I happened, and it's kind of like what I just said, you kind of got to have to move on. So that was, I think, the biggest thing in high school for me, man, was like to swallow that pill. As soon as I went into my freshman, maybe even sophomore year, I'd probably say freshman, maybe even sophomore year, take one or the other, everyone I knew in grade school was like, not my friend anymore. And I was like, oh, what the heck, what's going on, man? I tried to talk to him, not really talking to me, you know, all those groups started happening, you know, and I noticed like, oh, like, I'm not that kid anymore, you know? So with that, that's kind of where I kind of started to lose myself and like who I was. Like, dude, I was with all those people, you know, I played side, I played sports with these guys in grade school, I hung out with these guys that play football now in grade school. Now they're not talking to me, they're not talking to me, they're not talking to me. So, like I said, one of two ways you can go with that. I can totally let it damage me down to the ground and not understand it at all and live there. Or I can accept what's going on, take it in, understand it, and move forward. And like I said, as long as you're moving forward and not backwards, you're winning. And that's the biggest, that was the biggest just kick in my face in high school, man. It really was. Because it took a long time to even remotely know who you're hanging out with anymore. You know? And now, as we've been talking about, and we've been talking about throughout the weekend, you know, the power of choice. And so when you started to notice some of those challenges in life, and obviously you were so young where it's so it's such a new thing where you're trying to figure out yourself how to actually respond to this thing. Um, I know from parts of your story, um, obviously there were negative responses to that, and some of those things led to other negative things, and so on and so forth, um, you know, especially when it comes to coping with a lot of pain we often experience. Um, why don't you speak a little bit to some of those adversities that you did face, um, and then we can walk through a little bit of like, what was that pivotal point where um, you were able to kind of find an on-ramp out of those situations? So why don't you speak bit, a little bit about the, those adversities that you faced? Yeah, so um, it kind of went into, you know, hanging out. So from that, from me not knowing who I was and trying to find my group of friends that I kind of clicked with, um, it actually pushed me out of the high school group of people, and when I was in my freshman, sophomore year, I started hanging out with um, seniors and people that already graduated. So, if you put two and two together, this is where the story starts, right? So I started hanging out with a lot of people that were older than me, and they kind of took me out of where I needed to be in my life. With me not knowing, every time I say this story, um, it's kind of like I go back and I see that like, that would be all the choices that I made leading up to hanging out with this older group of people, and starting to live my life through these people and externally reaching for acceptance from these older, this older crowd that I was hanging out with, I slowly started to forget who I was. So, I mean, let me just go into the story, man. So yeah, so um, kind of went out of senior year, let's just hurry up and graduate, and um, I'm hanging out with uh, this older crowd for quite some time now. So after I graduated, which barely graduated high school, um, I was actually given a given a blessing from a teacher, she kind of pushed me through. <laughs> I believe she did. Um, so uh, hanging out with these people uh, really threw, my, threw me for a loop, you know? So they were working, they were living for the weekends, and I started kind of getting into some bad stuff with this, this group of people. So getting out of high school, I knew I had to get a job right away, and I knew I had to, you know, do as much as I can to make money to hang out with these people. So what it actually did to me was, they lived for the weekends, I started living for the weekends too. Once again, I was doing something for somebody else, not myself. So that kind of got into a whole ton of booze, um, an astronomical amount of alcohol, and some recreational drug use. Um, drug of choice at that time, cocaine, okay? And through these through hanging out with this group of friends for a couple of years, it kind of escalated from there. And I started to notice that the recreational use got a little deeper than recreational use. So moving out at like 22, 23 years old, um, 
had to be my own place, you know. Parents really didn't know what was going on. And um, I, had a I had a passion for cooking. I had a passion for cooking. You guys will even see. I have tattoos. I wear the stamp as a chef still to this day. They're not covered up. It's kind of a constant reminder of my past, um, which I don't live in. It's just a reminder. It's a reminder never to go back there again. We'll get into that too. Um, through the passion of cooking and still hanging out with the same group, I, I fi finally got into a kitchen for my very first time, talked to a chef, told him, hey man, this is my passion, this is what I want to do, because I felt like this was what I needed to do at that time. Like I told you, I had no, I had no drive ambition. I had no idea what my journey was. I didn't accept things for what they were. So what I'm trying to do is trying to find myself instead of create myself. Because at the end of the day, life isn't about finding yourself. It's about creating yourself. You're not going to flip over a rock and find, magically find something that's going to give you what you need in your life. You need to create it. And whatever it is, you may find it tomorrow. You may not find it until you're 37. I turned 38 in a couple of days, guys. I just found what I wanted to do in my life. Just found it. Okay? It took me that long. But I wasted a lot of time doing the wrong thing over and over and over again. Okay? So getting into the kitchen industry, it is rough. It's 364 days of work. You get Christmas off, your days off. Basically, are making menus, talking to the head chef, and sometimes you go in to help with prep because someone's sick that day. Very hardcore job. At this time, my recreational drug use is now completely drug use, drug driven. My, it drives my life at this point. My sous chef, who's the number two in line, was my cocaine dealer. Everyone in the kitchen did it, and some people in the restaurant did it. So when I say it was always around me, it was literally five feet from me at all times. At all times. But it was my choice. I put myself in that position from all of my choices leading up to it. I didn't know any better. I couldn't see past that. That's who I was at that time. I didn't even know who I was. So. The cocaine use and the alcohol gets to the point where something out of a Johnny Depp movie, Blow, you guys ever seen it? Shouldn't see it, too young. <laughs> um, it's uh, something out of a movie, guys. It's literally uh, cocaine consumed my life. I actually um, did so much cocaine I couldn't afford to do it anymore. So when that happens, you have a couple options. You can get it from someone else for free, which never happened. Or you can kind of figure out how you're going to get it. Or you can start selling something else for your addiction. Okay? So going down that path, I ended up starting selling uh, marijuana by the pound for my cocaine, addi my cocaine addiction. So now I have the worst group of people around me you can possibly have. I have people that are just coming over for pot, and I'm sitting there doing the drugs while they're over my house. These are the people that I chose to surround myself with at that time. Pretty crappy, huh? But I was looking for something. I was externally looking for validation of something. I wanted to get something from somebody just to make me happy, and that's what made me happy at the time. That's not happiness. <laughs> that, there's no way, shape, or form was I happy. All right? If you put a spectrum out, 0 to 100, 0 to 10, alpha to the omega, here's the starting, here's the finishing, I'm down here. You don't want to be here. What you think is bad is not bad. Countless days staying up, from drug use, failed relationships, no relationship with my family, lost all my friends, screwed up relationships. So one magical day, excuse me, guys, I get a drink of water. One magical day, I decided on 10 26, 2013 is a day that I am forever grateful for. 
And that's my one grateful thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say three grateful things I am grateful for, and that's one. So guys, you make another line on your piece of paper. Once you write down three things you're grateful for, whether that's personal, external, internal. It could be deep, it could be light. We should all have a couple things we're able to write down on those lines. 1026, 2013, I am forever grateful for that day. And you may not get that right now, but by the end of, the, by the end of my talk, you will maybe. That day is the day that I felt that this world would no longer need me in it. The walls have caved in at this point, and I feel like I've dug my own grave multiple times over, and I no longer think that I have any purpose in this world whatsoever. So on top of my drug addiction at this point, which was out of, completely out of control, so was I. No one could help me, no one could control me, I couldn't talk to anybody. Around that time too, of course, besides the pot that was in the house and all the other stuff, I had a bunch of pharmaceutical pills that were in the house also, because why? Why not? Why not just have the entire shop in your house, right? Who cares about safety? Who cares about any of that stuff? You just have it all, right? So on that day, I thought it'd be really cool to drink as much alcohol as I possibly could in a short period of time take every single pill I found in my sock drawer, I didn't care what it was, and to try to shove as much cocaine into my body as I possibly could. My goal was to either stop, blow up, or pass out, die that day. That was my goal. Like everything else in my life, I obviously failed at that. That's why I'm here. Every time I tell this story to people, it's like the craziest thing in the world. Because my entire life, until 2016, I was just a loser. I really was. I failed everything. Failed tests, failed friendships, schools, relationships, you name it, I failed it. I even failed to commit suicide the correct way. So... It gets a little hazy after that. I believe I picked up the phone and called some people and kind of said my fairly wells. I believe my sister's husband at the time, who I called, uh, kicked in my door, called the cops. That gets all super hazy, super fuzzy. Next thing I know, I woke up handcuffed to the bed at Silver Cross Hospital in the ICU. Clothes off, gown on, catheter in me. Don't know how it got there. Someone had to put it there. Okay. They're trying to measure the amount of alcohol and drugs I had in my body at that time. They're trying to measure if I was going to die. So for what felt like an eternity, and it was almost 48 hours, I snap out of it, I open my eyes, and the, just everything comes crashing down on me and says, you just failed, you failure. You are a loser even more than it was before I tried to kill myself. So the kicker of the whole story is, is of course they have to call your family, right? So my family was outside waiting as long as they could. Um, the nurses came in and I'm like, dude, tell them all to leave. <laughs> I didn't want to see anybody. I haven't seen them like really up until this point, right? So why the hell see them now? So, I, uh, I get let go, but before I get let go of my room, um, my father walks in, and uh, he doesn't say much. <laughs> he doesn't say much. You would think he'd be so pissed, so mad, that his son just tried to kill himself. So mad. But he wasn't. My father came up to me and gave me the biggest hug I've ever felt in my entire life. He told me that he loved me. And it wasn't like one of those hugs, you know? It was like that hug where someone hugs you so hard that you just physically feel that you're one. And I knew from that moment forward, like, man, something's gotta change. Something's gotta give, bro. 
but that's it, right? So my father drives, drives me home. I'm living by myself at this point because remember I told you I screwed every relationship, relationship up in my life I possibly could. I walk into my house. My door is taped shut from the cops. I obviously had to open that up and go in my house. I still lived there at the time. And what I see before me looked something out of a World War II movie. There was bottles everywhere. There was pills everywhere. There was a plate of cocaine in the corner covered up that the cops didn't see. There was pot on my bed that no one saw. This is what I come home to by myself. Probably not the safest place for me to be at that time. So when you're faced with something like that, like I said before, there's only one of two things you can possibly do. You can talk tail and run, keep yourself down, or you can move forward. After throwing everything away, cleaning up my house, dumping everything down the drain, I looked in the mirror for the final last time, and I said, this is the last time you're looking at this person. My father is my hero. I'm grateful for my father. That's my mother, too. Without that man, I would have no idea where I was at in my life. And it's funny, because growing up, I just thought he was a dad. He was a parent. He was yelling at me. He was scolding me. I don't have to do what you want to do that. Like, no. You guys, talking things out with someone that's been there or someone that's older, their years on you beats anything you know. There's a lot of people in this room that have years on you. And that's why you're here. It's fun to be with your friends for the learning experience. You guys can learn and grow together. Don't look at the people that are older than you as something.